Hey everyone, welcome back to Scar Bearers. This is Chris DT Gordon. It's great to have you here. I'm joined by my new friend, Kristen Lipinski. How are you, Kristen? I'm doing well today. Thanks, Chris. Excellent. And where are you joining me from? I'm in Peoria, Arizona. Oh, nice. How is it in Arizona this morning? It's actually quite nice this morning. Not too hot yet. Good. Not in the triple digits quite yet, huh? Not yet. We're getting up there. Well, uh, I'll let you have that. I'll keep our nice uh, 70 to 80 degrees we have here in Minnesota. You enjoy that. Yeah, we will. So, uh, Kristen, you and I have a personal connection because we are both survivors of necrotizing fasciitis, or as I'll call for the rest of our conversation, NF. And so, how did it happen for you? For me, it started in January of 2018. It was um, right before the school year started. I started to get this very painful, just a very deep pain in my armpit. It was almost like someone finger hooking under your armpit and never going away. And it was very similar to what you might feel if you pulled a muscle. And I thought for sure I pulled a muscle. I was always pulling muscles, but it just wouldn't go away, wouldn't go away. It was also at the height of the flu season that year, and it was a pretty bad flu season. All three of my children had been sick um, right before the holidays, and I thought I had made it through unscathed, and um, right before school started, this pain started, and then in the middle of the week of that first week of school, I started to get flu-like symptoms. Mm. And so when you got those symptoms, you were just thinking, oh, it's the flu, I'll just wait it out and do what I do with the flu, right? Absolutely. And so many people around me have come back to school with still getting over the flu. And um, I thought, oh, great. And then someone got too close and I got the symptoms. And I had a 103 temperature in the middle of the week and went to the, um, an urgent care that I was familiar with. And they tested and I was actually negative for the flu. Uh, but she was very concerned about my symptoms. She knew my kids had had it, and she was concerned about that pain. So she treated me for the flu anyway, and I went home and rested the rest of the day. But it didn't, never got better. Went back to work the next day. I was a wreck. I, went, I stayed home Friday. That particular PT called me, the PA called me and checked on me, and I told her I was still feeling awful. I was in bed. She said, you need to go to the emergency room. I'm worried this is worse than what we think. Went to another emergency room with my husband that day, stayed there for hours. They tested me. They did an EKG because of the pain being so close to the heart. It was nothing. They did another test of the flu. It did come back positive. So they sent me home to continue just to rest and do the Tamiflu that I was sent home with a few days before. And then the next day, again, it just kept getting worse. And I just was, I couldn't even get out of bed. And honestly, I don't even have memory of any of this. This is from my husband telling me. And he took me to a Dignity Health. And um, now beforehand, I didn't have any visual signs of anything looking bad. We had looked everywhere to see if there's anything that, a rash, an irritation, anything. And we couldn't see anything. So by that Saturday, several days later, I went to that urgent care and they were doing an examination and they saw the slightest redness on my side. And the doctor, hearing all the symptoms, she had an inkling of something worse. So that's when they sent me to a hospital by ambulance and they did a biopsy. And uh, 12 hours later, middle of the night, come back to change the bandages. And that's when they see the blistering of my skin and the purple and they took me to an emergency surgery, and that's when they discovered it was NF. Mm. So, you know, like my situation, yours, your symptoms or your physical symptoms didn't uh, manifest immediately. And so when you saw that all of a sudden after a few days of that pain, that there was something visible, how did you feel when you saw that? I was so, so overcome with pain. I mean, it, it surmounted, it's just worse than childbearing, worse than labor. It was, I mean, it, it numbed my mind. I mean, I couldn't even think coherently. And my mother and I take over caring for my kids because I just wasn't in bed. And I 
could barely think. And like I said, I don't even have a memory of my husband taking me to that hospital or the ambulance ride. Apparently I called my best friend from that ambulance and it, it just, it overtook everything. And I just, um, there's no functioning on my end. Wow. And that, it's fascinating because that is different from my experience. Uh, I noticed, you know, it took a few days for my physical uh, symptoms to, um, but when they did, I felt different pain sensations than you did. And I was still lucid. Uh, so it's really interesting how NF affects different people. So after you were taken to the hospital and you were you know, feeling this, uh, experiencing this physical and uh, pain sensations, what happened then? Um, so that's when they did the emergency surgery. Um, and during the surgery, you know, they came out and told my husband that they were basically chasing this bacteria. And uh, they told him to prepare for the worst because it was near my heart, it was near some vital organs, and they didn't know how it was going to affect. So um, it was a obviously very long surgery. Um, in the end, they ended up removing 30% of my soft tissue. So it runs from my shoulder, my entire armpit, down my chest, um, through my groin on my left mm. side. Um, once that um, that happened, I was just in a state of coma, and they kept me that way so they could take me in and out of the proceed out of the surgery so they could do some more debriding, make sure that the, the bacteria was in fact gone. Um, and I was at that hospital for probably a week after that surgery, and at that time when they confirmed I was stable and that there was no more surgeries that they needed to do on their part, that's when they had to start considering what was my recovery going to be like. Mm -hmm. And that's when they told my husband that they really recommended that they send me to the Arizona Burn Center because my condition would need grafting and that Arizona Burn Center was top notch when it came to the grafting. And so my husband agreed. Um, at the time, the, the hospital was considered our county hospital. And so there's a lot of mixed feelings about the county hospital. Um, and But they assured him that there was nothing compared to the Arizona Burn Center in our state. And they were, they were nationwide renowned for their, their doctors, their skills. And so my husband agreed. And they, from the minute that we arrived, um, in the ambulance again i'm i'm fully sedated and as i'm sure you already know that to move a person who is completely sedated that's pretty risky mm -hmm. and they, they wouldn't have done it if it hadn't have been for those pretty extreme circumstances that they had to get me to that point. so they they got me there safely one of the head surgeons of the burn center met my husband out there gave him peace of mind that they would take care of me they got me into the OR pretty quickly to just check the situation out. They said that there was very little debris they had to do. The doctor still raves about the surgeon that took care of me at the um, at St. Joe's. And um, it was from there that they had me um, still sedated, still comfortable, really just monitoring. Um, it was within a few days they tried to wake me up at the burn center, but I was having trouble breathing. And so when they did a chest x-ray they saw that my lungs had been filled the chest cavity not my lungs the chest area between my lungs um had filled with fluid so mm -hmm. then they had to go ahead and put a port in and uh as that was draining about two liters from each side had been drained out oh wow so by being flat all that time um that had just done a number on my chest so they kept me under for another couple of weeks my husband said it was a total of 24 days in that sedation um they wanted to just make sure that i was completely healed comfortable they had started putting wound backs on the wounds um i know there was at least two there could have been three while i was sedated um when i was under i remember having so many different dreams vivid dreams i still remember nightmares really because a lot of it would had to do with me looking for my children and uh falling in the pool uh, just a lot of things that my mind was trying to make sense of what was happening to me 
Um, I do remember one point um, I was walking on my school campus from my classroom to another classroom to go see some students. And there wasn't really anyone on the campus, which isn't, you know, too, un it's not um, uncommon for me to walk on campus and everyone's in their classroom and I'm going from room to room. But uh, there was no one that I could see, but yet I could hear my husband's voice and he was telling me, you're, you're being comfortable we have you sedated we don't want you in any pain and i'm looking around going huh <laughs> and i remember a woman's voice saying i'm here to help you i'm here to help take care of you and let you know your kids are safe i'm looking so did i get a nanny and i'm thinking these thoughts in my dream and so then of course i have several other dreams and then all of a sudden i'm um waking up another weird dream before i woke up <laughs> and included throwing up rainbow <laughs> very oh. odd and then all of a sudden, and there's my mom and my sister-in-law in my face saying they almost lost me and of course my mind goes to I was in a car accident mm -hmm. and then again it's my kids and so and after that I blanked out again and then my mind was so off I kept seeing kids everywhere all these mm -hmm. kids were going to take care of me well in fact it was the nurses but in my head it was it was the kids Oh, wow. And in the hospital is in the library. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, I was tripping out. Yeah, <laughs> no, really quick. Uh, were you under the influence of ketamine by any chance? Which one? Ketamine. Uh, you know, I don't remember that name. Okay. I was because, on fentanyl a long time. Okay, because when uh, during my sedation and my first number of weeks of my recovery i was on ketamine and i i can tell you stories about the hallucinations i was having uh let's put it this way at one point the room flipped upside down oh, yeah. while i was awake oh yes yeah and so yeah we i'm sure between the two of us we could write a book about uh the different hallucinations and so um going I guess uh, fast forwarding a bit to when you finally woke up, what was that like? Very surreal. When I, my husband came in and he just started going right into, honey, you, you had necrotizing fasciitis. And I was like, what is that? And of course, oh, well, I couldn't speak. I had no voice. So he's right up in my, his ear up in my mouth so I can ask him what is that and and he says it's the flesh eating bacteria and my mind immediately went to a previous Grey's Anatomy episode where uh, <laughs> a young woman who was on her honeymoon got necrotizing fasciitis because she um she fell and I guess she cut her leg on oyster shells mm -hmm. and I was like but I wasn't in any water and he's like honey we know we know we we aren't really sure where it came from and um and so then, of course, I'm looking at my body from where I am in the bed, and my left arm was just about three times its normal size. Mm -hmm. My fingers were so swollen, they, and the, the skin was like peeling from my skin, from my hand, because it was just so huge. And my husband was explaining to me that I was pretty close to losing my arm because everything was so close to the arteries, and they weren't sure if they were going to be able to save it. And mm -hmm. um, he was trying to explain to me where all of the injuries were. And of course, my model brain could only take in so much. And then after that, it was a slew of you know friends coming to visit and everyone had to re-explain what had happened. And I still wasn't grasping it. And they were also telling me that you're on the news and, and there's all this going on. And I'm just like, you're all crazy. No, no, there isn't, no. And it was probably another week of course the timetable of that particular moment when I finally woke up and was awake um is fuzzy but um it, it it took a long time for me to really understand okay I really got sick and I had this strange thing attack me and I still don't know why and they had been speculating that I had cut myself shaving maybe with an old razor that had done it um, and, and maybe it was a combination of things. I still think it has to do with um, chafing, and maybe it was a eraser that was too old. 
but uh, I usually try to keep tabs of that kind of thing, but um, mm -hmm. it could have just been a combination. It could have been even the lotion, the oil that I was rubbing on my skin to help with the, the chafing, but um, as one thing that was really hard during that first recovery was once I was awake, I couldn't go back to sleep. Mm. <laughs> I was awake all the time and the nurses would get on me and say, you need to rest, you have a surgery in the morning because they would put me under to do anything that had to do with the, um, the wound bats, to move yep. anything. And so I was very grateful for that. And I just remember telling them like, I can't sleep. You know, I obviously I've been asleep for quite a while now. I can't sleep. And so movies became the thing that I could do because I couldn't read, couldn't focus, yeah. couldn't hold a book. And so I, my husband would bring me movies and I would just kind of stare at them. Otherwise my mind would just get lost in itself. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I would get down the why me path and what, why did this happen? And, Anyway. And so, um, you know, I guess, first of all, what kind of movies were you watching? I, when I was in there, um, I'm not sure if you're, if you're familiar with the Marvel Cinematic Universe or uh, the Netflix series, like Daredevil. Oh, no, I haven't watched Daredevil yet. Okay, that, that had just been released when I, was in, when I was in the hospital. So I watched a lot of Daredevil, a lot of Flash. I'm a big geek, as you can see. And so that was my go-to. What were you watching while you're uh, in the hospital? Well, at first my husband tried to get me on Netflix and that was hilarious because I had my daughter's tablet and I only had the one, the right hand to work, but my hand -right coordination was not together. So <laughs> me trying to get the thing to start was hilarious. But unfortunately the, the Wi-Fi in the hospital was horrible. And so we oh. ended up not... Netflix didn't work for us. I tried, but we could only do things that I had previously downloaded. Mm -hmm. So my husband ended up bringing in our portable DVD player that we've had since the start of our marriage, which had been about 12 <laughs> at that point. And then all these DVDs of just movies that I like. I'm, I'm a, I love the 80 movies and just the funny comedies. And uh, I love to cook, so I had a lot of food movies, you know, Chef, Julie and Julie, Julie, Julie and Julia, and, and he'd bring some of those, and I would get upset with them, because I was like, I can't eat, I can't drink, I'm so <laughs> but yet you bring me these. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, I loved all the John Candy movies, you know, mm -hmm. they would make me laugh, or they would just at least take my mind off of what was going on for a couple hours. Yeah. So how many surgeries uh, do you have in all, uh, you know, including the uh, debridement and the wound back and the skin graft harvesting and placement uh, surgeries? Uh, a rough count when I was talking with the nurses through my stay was about a total of 24. And I was there about 75 days. Wow. Including St. Um yeah, the, uh, my time in the hospital, it included, um, they moved me to another room that wasn't the, the burn ICU. And uh, from that point on, it was getting me to stand up. It was balancing out the amount of the, the food they were giving me, which I could not stand. I had nightmares and I would wake up gagging with that horrible food tube. <laughs> mm. They, uh, it was a lot of wound back changes. It when my skin, the area was finally healed enough to start the grafting, they did all the explaining of the type of grafting they would do. First, they would try it out with like the pig skin or something. Uh, and then after they knew that was okay, then they would start doing the grafting. So they started in the groin. And I remember thinking, okay, this is okay. I'm feeling okay. Then they did that first bandage change. And Oh, it's yeah. like doing a slide out on sunburn on asphalt. It, oh, um, that was horrendous. And I had one of my good friends, my best friend in the room, and she about fainted from the pain that I was having and the heat in the room. And oh, it was horrendous. And mm. from that point on, it was just piecemealing together. Um, mm. After that healed and everything was okay for a few days, then they... Um, 
they were worried about how much they were going to have to harvest and where is it going to come from? Because obviously in that time I had lost probably 20 to 25 pounds in weight and there wasn't much surface area that they were going to be able to work with as that. This is them explaining it to me. And so that's when um, Dr. Foster, one of the lead surgeons in the burn center came to my husband and said, you know, we work with the FDA and we have um, something we called resell that we use on burn patients. And he had my husband YouTube it. He showed me some of these videos. And there is a, a woman who had gone through a significant amount of burns. I want to say over 80% of her body, she, um, uh, her apartment building had blown up and her boyfriend had saved her and gotten her out. But a significant portion of her body had been burned. Well, they, she was, um, she was documented because they used resell on her. And so if you don't know what resell is, it's, um, it's an amazing enzyme that will take your own tissue and it breaks it down into a liquid form and they put it in a sprayer. Mm. And once they do the grafting on you, which, you know, they take your skin, your donors, and then they stretch it out, they needle it out and they lay it on. And then what they'll do is they'll spray your skin on top of your skin and with it all being my body, my cells, my DNA, it helps it heal faster and better. And it helps it just stay where I'm sure, you know, when you do grafting, sometimes your body can reject that graft. Yep. And, um, and so the resell helps that not happen. It helps it all stay. So they didn't do resell in the groin. It was a small area. They first wanted to see how my body was going to be susceptible to the grafting. Um, but then, um, in order to do the resale, they had to get special permission because at this point it had only been allowed for burn survivors and they had never used it on a necrotizing fasciitis patient. And so they had to go to FDA and get, um, compassionate use permission saying how much was needed, what surface area they were working with. And, um, I, I was praying for it. I really was. I just, because I knew this would be something that would get me to my kids sooner and my husband and I were just praying for it and hoping for it and then when they came in and said you've been approved you're getting it oh my I bawled I bawled I was so happy they couldn't believe how happy it was because I just one step closer and of course I'm sure they told you as well when you're in the hospital and all after all the surgeries I was going to have to go to a rehab facility before I could go home mm-hmm. and I just thought no I'm going home <laughs> I'm not going to a facility I'm going home so um, when I did the resale, everything, it, it happened, it healed the way that they were helping. Um, the worst part about that was the donor sites to me. That was horrendous. But thankfully, that only lasted about three days. And on that fourth day, it was tolerable. It was still okay. not the feeling, but it was tolerable. And then after that, they had to start working on applying a flap for my armpit area because it was a gaping hole. Mm-hmm. And doing grafting, as I'm sure you know, Chris, um, if you did just grafting, it's just too tight. It doesn't give, and yeah. I wouldn't be able to use my arm anyway. So the plastic surgeon suggests a lateral flap, and the lateral flap is still connected to your body, still connected to the artery. So they took a chunk from my back, ran the line to my armpit, and um, I had to go through about 24 to 48 hours of hoping that it would survive still Mm -hmm. attached to arteries, but not attached to my body yet. And that was just a horrendous time because the nurses would come in and say, don't move, don't move. And I'm like, okay, I have to be still for 40, 48 (laughs) hours. You're kidding me. And, um, that was just horrendous. I was so nervous because I wanted it so bad Mm -hmm. so that I continue to heal and get out of there. And, uh, before the surgery, they were like, you know, it's just, oh gosh, you know, it's, it's just not surviving, Kristen. You know, we're just, we're sorry. And um, the, the uh, plastic surgeon had a, a resident that he was working with who uh, we had something in common. His children were also going to in the same district that I was in. And uh, he knew my principal. And so we had, we had something in common and he wanted his daughter to go to that school. And um, but so he kept coming in just saying, oh, so sorry. It's just, it doesn't look like it's going to survive. And so they had me scheduled to go in to hope to reattach it. But when the surgeon came in, he said, 
yeah, it's not looking like it's going to survive. So we're just going to remove it. And then we'll talk to you about the free flap. And that would be having to do a much longer surgery to take a flap from another section of the body, which I know you know about. Mm -hmm. And then that's um, even, even, even dicier, you know, wondering if that's going to make it. Mm -hmm. So we go in the surgery and I'm, on, I'm, um, I've come to terms with, okay, we're going to have to go through this. It's going to be longer. My husband was devastated because he wanted me home. And I was like, okay, let's do this. And so did it, woke up, and I have the resident's face in my face going, we got it. We got it. Like, we got to save a lot of it. Oh, my gosh, it's attached. And I was just, oh, I, again, cried, happy tears. Because, again, it was like, now we can move forward. Um it was, we definitely had to baby the flap. We had to protect the flap. <laughs> the flap was the baby for a long time. Yeah. Um, and then at that point, then they could start coming in and do the final grafting of my shoulder. And it was just a matter of getting me stronger, walking, doing that PT. Right before I left, I had the physical therapist create an Olympic obstacle course in the hallway. I had to do squats, do, do my oh, nice. lunges. I had to climb up on gurneys and Oh, that was, that was awesome. I had to be able to get on the floor and get back up again. And when they were like, you got it, girl, you're going home. You're not going to rehab. That was a huge celebration. And I was sent home the March 31st and Easter that year was the very next day, April 1st. Oh, wow. And I was so ecstatic to be able to go and be home there with my family and uh, have a celebration. So I missed out on my oldest daughter's birthday valentine's day not that we make a big deal about it but it was something that you know we would do little gifts or just, you know something with each other and i was happy to be there for easter that's great yeah um you know i i missed uh my twins's birthday when i was in the hospital and so they actually had a small party uh for me and for the twins uh, in the hospital where we brought some presents to open. And so, you know, you just do what you can. And I'm yeah. so happy that uh, that procedure worked and you were able to um, be discharged without having that physical therapy, you know, go to that rehab center. So after discharge, what was your next steps? What well, they sent me with a wound back on the axilla area to just continue the healing around the flap and the grafting that had just been done. And I had had to have the wound backs um, on and off to just continue to heal that grafting. Really but quick, Kristen. Of... I'm, so, I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. But I was thinking that maybe we should explain what a wound back is because you and I both know what it is, but mm -hmm. someone listening might not understand that. So what is a wound back? Well, you may have to jump in and help me explain it, but a wound vac is basically they will like suction off the area of the body that needs to have that healing. And what it is, is um, it's going to be, it's recycling the fluid in your body in the skin area that it's like aerating the area in order to continue to heal it and keep the healing going because just the oxygen in the air, it needs more than that. Yes. You want to jump in and help me out here. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think you you know, uh, without getting, you know, too technical to the point where we're uh, running into uh, accuracy accuracy issues, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> so, so I'm sorry, I uh, keep going forward with uh, what you're telling me. So, I had to go home with a, a portable wound back and uh, my first appointment with the burn clinic, which is offset from the center, uh was the Monday after Easter, Monday or Tuesday after Easter. So uh, that wound vac was not happy, was constantly beeping because air was escaping. And so we went in and we, we they did a thorough check of the, the flap area of the grafting and we told them about the, the wound vac um, beeping. And the doctor, it was a different doctor, but still within the burn area, said that he was like, you know, I think we need to start moving you into the physical therapy, which I was ecstatic about. I just wanted to be able to move. Mm -hmm. And he said, let's get rid of this wound back. And that was probably one of the one of the few times I had to be awake for the removal of all the, the tape and the bandages. Uh, but um, we got rid of that. And then we got set up with the physical therapist, which the oh, occupational therapist that I just have become really good friends with in the hospital it worked really well on me, got my hands kind of moving a bit more. Um, she recommended the physical therapist that she used to work with. So. 
I started working with her and it was twice a week for four months. Mm. And in the beginning, um, my hand, uh, in the hospital, everything was stiff. I had no control of my hand whatsoever. And my, the plastic surgeon you know, and the OTs kept saying, you've got to keep moving it and keep moving it. So I, with my other hand, I would constantly bend my fingers down for them and then they'd bounce back up and I'd bend them down, bounce back up. And then over time, before I was discharged, I was able to get these fingers in a ball, but these were stiff, stiff, stiff. I couldn't do anything with them on my own. Um, so when I was in OT, she would squeeze and squeeze and I had no feeling. So they would start me on the fine motor skills of trying to pinch beans and pennies and oh, it was excruciating. I was like, I can't do this. Uh, but so doing that for a few weeks, finally got to the point where I can get this finger down and then I was able to start moving. And so it, it just, it started to get the nerves moving again. Um, lots of massages of the grafted area because it was like armadillo skin and you know, trying to work that and soften that. And um, just everything to start getting the strength going. But she still had to abide by restrictions that my uh, the plastic surgeon had put on me. Uh, I'll just show you with my arm. When I left the hospital, I couldn't move my arm past this point, which is not a full 90. Yeah. And he wouldn't let it go above 90 degrees. So with her help, I was able to get to that 90 degree. Lots and lots of exercises at home, which I was super good at keeping up with and my kids would be in the room with me and I'd be on the floor my mom stayed with us for two months after I was out of the hospital and she lives in Missouri so she mm -hmm. stayed with us to help me get back on my feet literally Great. um and she so I'd be there on the floor with this this cane that my husband had and I'd be moving my arms back and back just trying to stretch those muscles to get my full uh, mobility back again so we got to that 90 degree mark, had to go to the plastic surgeon, you know, wanted to get the restrictions lifted. He wanted to go ahead and remove everything because he didn't like the way the flap was. He mm. wanted me to grow a balloon in my back and then go through the whole free flap process um, months later. And I just was, I was devastated because I had just gotten out of the hospital. I'm like, you want me to go back? And I remember asking him, like, is this life threatening? Do I have to do this? And he says, well, if you want good quality life, you do. And it was, uh, it was other doctors and people too that said, you have a choice. It's your body. You know, remember it's your body. You do what you're comfortable with. And if you feel comfortable doing that, then go for it. But if you feel that you're happy now and you want to keep going with your physical therapy to see where they can take you, um, you make that choice. And I told my physical therapist and she was, she was adamant. She was like, I'll get you where you want to go. You don't need a surgery to do that. And so I told him no. And then once the restrictions were lifted, she just had at it. She went at it with me. And there were some painful sessions, but I just, mm -hmm. I let's do it. Make me cry. I don't care. Get me through this. And she did. Within four months, um, I was back up there. This is about where I was at that time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't 180, but I was getting about 160s when I graduated from OT. That's excellent. At that time, um, school was starting. And when I left the hospital, my husband was encouraging me to just take that year off and wanted, you know, because he didn't know how long it was going to be. Um, you know, he was expecting me to have to go to rehab and I, would, I wouldn't I would be able to work for a year. And there was a lot of fundraising for me and um, they made it possible that I wouldn't have to work for another year. But I looked at the discharge and I just was like, if I don't go back to work, I'm not me. If I'm not teaching, I'm not me. I need to get back on my feet as soon as I possibly can, and I need to be me. And so when working really hard in the summer and being mom again, because my mom left at the end of the school year in May, I had to get be completely on my own, which is what I needed. I tell my kids they were the absolute best therapy because I had to drive them. I had to get them to their swim lessons. I had to get them to their friends. And um, it just, it got me out of that patient mode and back into mom. And yeah. that really, really put my recovery in the fast lane. Yeah. And by July, I was calling the doctors at the burn center saying, so what do you think? 
and I go back to work and they're like, there's really nothing holding you back. If you want to go, we got you. We support you. So it convinced my, my district a little bit, but they all agreed. Okay, she's coming back. And I was able to go back that school year. Uh, that's awesome. You know, that's always a good, uh, just just a relief that you can get back to life as you know it. Mm-hmm. And what do you teach? I'm a special education teacher. And in this district right now, and I'm working with the junior high students. Okay. Yes. It's, we are twins. Same here. And uh <laughs> you know, and those kids they uh you know they, they offer the, the kind of challenge that you need not only physically but also mentally to keep you on your game. And and so I bet that was it was probably weirder for them knowing how happy you were to see them than for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was pleasantly surprised when I came back and my um my then seventh grade boys come back as eighth grade boys for that meet the teacher. And there I was in the classroom and they were like, this is Lipinski, you're here. And <laughs> it, was, it was pretty, pretty amazing to see these big boys just so happy to see me. And unfortunately, and fortunately, um, my, uh, my story and recovery was on the news a lot and they watched it all. They watched me when I was at my lowest, not knowing how it was going to turn out. And um, so they came in definitely relieved to see that I was still standing there. That's awesome. Uh, and, you know, I, I told the doctors, you know, a lot of the times I joked in the, in the hospital that, you know, they're explaining things to me. And I'm like, oh, I got this. I'm like, you guys know I'm a special ed teacher, right? I don't have a, they're trying to talk to me about, you know, my mental capacity and trying to not be, you know, depressed and trying to be motivated. I was like, you guys can a special ed teacher. You know, that's what I do on a daily basis. You know, I got, <laughs> I got my own coach here. We're good. Yeah. And they, they laugh all the time, but they're like, it's true though. It's true. You know, your day job comes into it. <laughs> You're like, you know, it, it, I used it for the good. And um, I, I use my experience a lot with my students, you know, when they're feeling low about, their difficulties it's like we all have difficulties and it just looks different in life and we all have a wall we have to climb and it's we have to figure out how we're going to get up that wall and we all have to come up with our own strategies that work for us in that situation and you know sometimes it worked with the kids to motivate them sometimes it didn't but um I, it was great to be able to say, hey, I know how you feel. I may not know exactly how you feel in this situation, but I've been through a time in my life where I definitely had some struggles and I had to find a way to get through it. Yeah, and that's, and, and like you said, uh, that's not only a good lesson for students to learn, but that's a huge life lesson for anyone to learn. Absolutely. Uh, and so where are you at now? Uh, what are you doing? Uh, you know, how has this uh, situation uh, affected you uh, on your day-to-day life two years afterwards? Two years afterwards, I honestly feel like I'm in the best shape of my life. Uh, I've always been one to be up on exercise, always wanted to eat healthy, and really make, my husband told me that the doctors told him when I was in that first scary surgery um, that my health saved if uh, I was not so inept at taking care of myself, uh, my heart not being good, then I may not have had as best a chance to survive. So now um, I'm still at the same school. My, my children are young. My youngest is just starting kindergarten this year. And so I, I wanted to stay there so that I could still be a part of his schooling, so I could still pop over and see events that he's doing with his class. Mm-hmm. Um, but during that time, I, I really fell in love with occupational therapy. And I had worked really well with occupational therapists before being a special ed teacher. And I just, I really loved what they had to do. I loved the sensory aspect of it all. And I, I just started to fall in love with it. And I, I told the occupational therapist, who also was a previous teacher, that I think that was something I wanted to do. So some point in my life, I would like to get to occupational therapy school. It's not in the finances right now. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it really isn't the best fit for my family if I were to stop what I'm doing. Um, 
so it's on the it's on the list you know one day maybe we can make it happen but um right now i'm i'm really happy with my school i'm really happy with my students and i'm still working with my junior hires and our first day of school is tomorrow all right yeah and um as far as how i'm i'm feeling uh, about a year ago i mentioned earlier that my range of motion stopped about here and uh, the doctors you know are checking it out and they're like you know you've got some major scar bands here really holding you back you know mm. we really should look into doing a release because you know that's going to hold you back we don't want arthritis to set in years later so we talked about my options i did not want to do more grafting so they did something called a z-plasty yep and what that is it's a zigzag cut on your skin and it's like when they do that, they sort of move your skin as if it's like a, almost a zipper to reattach it, but it they make the graphene reattach to healthy skin, and then it just elongates that mm -hmm. motion. Now I'm up here now, and so they're just amazed that I'm at that point now because we didn't think that was going to happen. Yeah. So now I can still reach things on the top shelf. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have I've done yoga. I do yoga every morning to keep up with that stretching because if I don't I feel it everywhere. Oh yeah. It definitely tightens and, up. Yeah. Yeah, you, you gotta get it gotta do those uh what's my favorite? The upward dog. <laughs> that full stretch of the grafting. Yeah. And it's the best feeling ever. Uh but I, I have um I've still stayed in contact with the hospital and their foundation and I work very closely with the Arizona Burn Foundation because Arizona Burn Foundation, they, they come forward for all those families affected by, by burn, but anyone through the burn center, they help. So they were a big part of my family as well, just um, supporting us. And they can support financially. They can support through, um, you know, even therapy. If we need to, to reach out to them, they'll help you find the therapy you need. Uh, we ended up being adopted for Christmas that year and it was just such a relief because it was that first hard year and a family had adopted us That's and that awesome. was a wonderful lesson to our children that there's good people in the world and when you're hurting you know someone could be there to help you to pick you up and just doing that, that special thing at Christmas surprising my kids with some gifts is like oh it was amazing and so I've been working with them as well sharing my story um helping with fundraising um so I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of just something different something completely out of the realm of anything i ever would have thought i would do in this life mm -hmm. and um, my the foundation with the hospital they are now called valley wise health and they are working very hard fundraising to try to make an even bigger arizona burn center because mm. like I said, people come from all over to the center. And so some of the fundraising we're doing is um, we're getting some survivors from the burn center, I'm included, and we're doing some hikes. And oh, in nice. fact, this September, we were supposed to be going to, to Kilimanjaro. Oh, wow. <laughs> yep, they wanted to be taking um, several burn survivors, but they wanted to include an NF survivor because uh, I had gone through quite a bit, pretty similar to a burn survivor as a, as mm -hmm. a youth Chris. Yeah. And so they wanted to just use us as an example, like, hey, this is what we do. We take people that have been, have met almost the end of their lives and they have gone through an, well, the, the most intense pain you could imagine in recovery, but these people are living their lives again and they can do anything that anyone else can do that haven't been burned or affected by NF. And we're, we're gonna climb Mount Kilimanjaro and we're gonna wow. show you that they can still live a life no matter what they are facing now. And you know, as many many NF survivors have, have lost limbs, mm -hmm. several limbs. Yes. And we are very lucky, Chris, you and I, that we were able to keep our, our arms and everything else attached. Um, exactly. So it's it's amazing that you know this group is it's courage rising. And it's an amazing name because it's keep that courage. Don't lose that courage in your daily life, even after well after you've been through the trauma you've been through. Um, because mentally it can always sneak back up on you. So having these little goals of climbing a mountain, um, 
which we aren't able to go this September. We're hoping for next June yeah. because of COVID, but we are going to be um, continuing and doing a Grand Canyon rim to rim in nice. October. So we're training for that right now. And it's, it's great because it gives me that physical purpose just to keep going and uh, keep healthy and, it's like, no, I, I got to keep showing that you can still live a great life, an active life. Exactly. That's a great, that's, that's a, yeah, that's a great message. So if someone want to reach out to you or learn more about the Arizona Burn Center, where would they go? Uh, they can go to um, really just type in the Arizona Burn Center and Valley Wise Health, and it'll pop up. The whole uh, story of the Arizona Burn Center will pop up. And then they can go to azburn.org if they want to look at the Arizona Burn Foundation. Okay, great. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Kristen. I greatly admire you and appreciate your story. Uh, and it's weird how much it correlates with mine. <laughs> and right. so it really, uh, it really made me made my day to talk with you today. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. So uh, you have a great day. And we'll talk with you later. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Kristen. One thing I did forget to ask her. I didn't ask her what her favorite dinosaur was, but I did afterwards. And she told me it's a triceratops. So she loves the three horned plant eaters. So there you go. If you want to find more about her, you can check her out on Facebook at Kristen Lipinski. And if you want to learn more about the Arizona Burn Center, you can find that at wee.azburn.org. Or if you want to check out the Valley Wise Health uh, situation, uh, organization, we'll go with that. That sounds more professional. It's at www.valleywisehealth.org. You can always find me on the interwebs at Chris DT Gordon on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. You can also check out my website, www.chrisdtgordon.com to find out what I have to offer as a professional speaker and coach. As always, Thanks for joining me today. Have a great day and remember to pass on perfection and go for greatness.